Okay, so this morning, I mean, we're, we're a week out or eight days out, so anything I show you is practically next to useless, to be honest. But if there's a, if there's a model that I tend to track that I think has got some reasonable accuracy to it uh, this far out, it's the University of Washington models, who, which are really, really good. Anybody has access to them. The link's right there. Um, and uh, so this morning, I pulled the la latest one, which was basically, it would be uh, basically a week tonight. Um, it's 5 o'clock uh, Pacific Daylight Time uh, on Thursday. So it's basically just before the dinner starts. And well, what was interesting, and if you, if you, what I did this morning is I, I actually walked through the entire week to see, well, what is actually happening? And that's what I like to do starting about now. I'll start looking at the big picture. This is a 36-kilometer forecast. I'll show the next slide just down to the 12-kilometer. But I'll start looking at this kind of level out into the Pacific and start saying, geez, uh, where are the lows? Where are the highs? You know, what's going on out there? You know, get a bit of a sense of the story behind what you think is happening. And the, to make to make it sort of simple for you, um, this, is say, is the latest one I could download uh, today or this morning. Um, w this high over the course of the last four or five days in this model, so starting over the weekend, that high was down in this area somewhere. And it has basically slowly been tracking in this northeasterly direction. And in some of the models, if you look, I looked also at s some of the longer range uh, predict wind models, and I looked at several different models, the European model, Canadian model, GFS model. They're actually showing a, a almost a little bit of a, a high pressure sort of tongue that's coming off here um, at around the same time up into, uh, up into Puget Sound and up into Georgia Strait. So if you... Um, if I was to if I was to gamble, I had to guess tonight. I would say that high is quite likely going to keep building. It would be interesting to see it tomorrow. It'd be interesting to see it the next day, and just keep keep and keep and keep well, well, uh, keep monitoring it, and seeing what's happening. What that's doing is really deflecting um, any of the lows and any of the fronts from coming into this. And so, if you actually look at the 12k version of this, which gets into a little more detail in Puget Sound and the south part of Georgia Strait, um, you can see it. On at least a week tonight, it's pretty darn light. It's very, very light. Um, and uh, and if you look at the turn the temperature grids on, I was looking at the temperature grids this morning. It's going to be cold too. So um, so uh, it's time for us all to see if we can change to the inshore course, Mike. Is that all right? We can change. We can't change. Okay, that's too bad. That's very unfortunate. Um, so um, yeah, th that you know, at an overall sense, that's what it kind of looks like. You know, so if I were you, if I would go on the under the Google, type in Northeast Briefing pa uh, Pacific Briefing Package, uh, type in, go into the University of Washington site, um, have a look at these charts, and start watching them over the next few days. And the thing to watch for, for me, would be watch that high pressure area, which is sitting down in here, and it's just slowly sort of starting to move in this northeastly direction. So it uh, looks like a light and cool, and let's hopefully uh, uh, moonlit night, because <laughs> we're going to need, we're going to need, we're going to need something to cheer us up. Yeah, let's hope. So, but um, it's seven days out. Um, chances are it'll blow, blow a bloody gale. Now that I've said that, so, um, so, um, I talked about uh, in the 2010 race. As most people know, was a was the only time this race has ever been abandoned, um, and um, there was an awful lot of uh, uh, difficulties held on the race course, as uh, to put it mildly. And uh, as I was archi when we were researching in the archives for our pub night tomorrow, I stumbled upon this one-page excellent set of lessons learned that Rich wrote after he convened a meeting of some of the sailors to talk about what happened. So I'm going to turn it over to Rich to go through them. Thanks, Peter. So I don't know how many of you guys were in the 2010 race. Um, it's one of those things that you tell a lot of stories about. Um, we had a couple of boats get in relatively serious trouble. Um, one in particular, uh, Incisor. I don't know if there's anybody from Incisor here. Okay, we can pick on them a little. Um, and interesting, they were both West Vancouver Yacht Club boats. Um, I think Dave Char, I think he was a Commodore that year, if I'm not mistaken, or, or Vice Commodore. Or yeah, I think he was Commodore. Um, he, he, because he was Commodore, he was supporting the club, he went in the race. Um, he got dismasted somewhere uh, somewhere closer to Nanaimo than, than here. Um, they got dismasted, and then their um, 
engine didn't start because the fuel had been so shaken up by all the waves. They had dirty fuel and they couldn't start. So uh, a ferry diverted to them and uh, put them in their lee. And I think the rescue guys from Nanaimo came out and towed them in or something. I forget how they actually ended up. Um, the, the situation with Incisor was quite a bit more dire. Um, uh, Curry Bow, I don't know how long is Incisor, maybe 26, 27 feet long, something like that. Um, they basically got rolled in a wave and the boat filled up with water, basically swamped. Um, the crew, the skipper, um, Clint Curry drifted away from the boat uh, quite a distance. The rest of the crew was sort of around the boat. Uh, the hovercraft came out, and as they never failed to tell me afterwards, in conditions they weren't supposed to be out, um, came out and, and basically plucked the rest of the crew out of the water. Uh, Clint had disappeared, sort of downwind. Um, another boat on the short course from, I believe, Nanaimo, um, was sailing by and happened to notice him in the water and picked him out of the water. Um, that was a but for the grace of God moment uh, for everybody. If that boat hadn't seen him, and, and if you were out there in 2010, you know just how brutal the conditions were and the visibility, um, we would have had the first fatality in Straits. Um, thank God that didn't happen. But So we had people from both those boats. So after it all happened, we convened um, a seminar or, or just a get-together brainstorming session of the lessons that we learned so that we could pass them on for future races. So these are basically the summary. It's been a long time since I've looked at these. Um, first one was uh, Maine should have a second deep reef. A lot of boats didn't feel they were able to reduce their sail enough. Um, if you have a frack rig boat, there are there are there is a school of, uh, of thought that you don't want a reef so that the head of the sail is below uh, where the stay is attached to the mast. Um, in those conditions, then, you have to know the conditions your boat is capable of. I'm going to be sailing this race in a FAR 30. I'll tell you right now, if the conditions at the start are like they were for 2010, we will not sail in the race. Okay, so you got to know what your boat is capable of. We do not have a deep, uh, a second reef in the main because, well, it's one design boat, and who wants to carry around another reef? Uh, but mainly because if you put a second reef in, that the head of the sail would be well below where those shrouds are, and you'd probably invert your mast. But you do carry a storm jib. We do have a storm jib. Uh, fortunately, the race, the, the one design rules for a FAR 30 is that the number three that you carry is actually built like a storm jib. And the big difference for that is it has grommets along the luff so that you can tie it to the forestay. Right? You're not relying on the head foil to keep it in there. And a lot of the problems boats had in 2010 was their jibs just blowing right out of the foil. Um, the guys that ended up in the water, um, they almost lost a couple of them being hauled into the boat. Uh, either the hovercraft or uh, I think it was a... J-30 was the rescue boat they called Clint. They had a heck of a time getting Clint out of the water, a long, long time. Um, and if you go to any of David's excellent uh, sailing at sea courses, they talk a lot about recovering people out of the water. Uh, with a crotch strap, that's dramatically easier. Um, a, lot of, a lot of boats didn't, when they needed to find emergency equipment, they couldn't find it. They were out in... Big seas, big wind, everybody's a little bit shocked, quite frankly, by the conditions. Um, it is now, under the safety rules, uh, uh, PIYA now requires this. The OSRs use that for years. You should have a chart showing where all the location of the safety equipment is. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows this story, but um, there's been, in Swiftshire, our kind of sister race, um, there's been two fatalities over the years. One of those fatalities happened when the skipper of the boat got washed overboard just past race rocks, going to weather in a lot of breeze. The crew went to deploy the uh, life ring and the pole and everything, and it was all tangled up. They didn't have a knife on them. So the skipper was literally in the water shouting at them where to go down below to get a knife. By the time they got out with the knife, this he was gone washed up on the shore the next day dead. 
make sure everybody knows where the stuff is. This is a very interesting one. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have bilge pumps that just have a great big long hose that kind of goes down near the bilge somewhere into the, certainly the far 30s are like that. Um, they were convinced on incisor that once it swamped, they could have pumped it dry, except the hose was unsecured and it floated on top of the water inside the cabin. So there's a little bit of air in the cabin. Guess where the hose was floating? Just at the top of that. They, the, the bilge pump was useless. So I immediately, I'm on hearing that, went to the far and secured it down there. Clean fuel tank, that's what happened to Dave Chard. Uh, he lost his mast, couldn't start his engine. You don't have sails, don't have an engine. It's blowing 50, 60 knots, not a pleasant place to be. Uh, again, talking about recovering bodies, that came from, from uh, getting Clint back on board. Uh, this was a big one. You know, in 2010, we all went blasting out of here on this big southeasterly. And it became apparent to most of the boats in the fleet that it was time to run for shelter. Uh, you got to know where you, people ended up in the, in the most strange places. I mean, there was somebody that went into uh, Schooner Cove or French Creek, and they basically tucked themselves in behind a breakwater and spent the whole night with waves crashing over the breakwater and fortunately going over their boat. Um, there was one boat that, that I admired greatly that went and just basically anchored in the lee of Bolinas Island, got as close to the island as they could, put the anchor down, just stay there all night. Uh, our boat, we actually ended up in Secret Cove of all places. Um, long story, but uh, we ended up running on bear poles all the way down to Secret Cove. It was actually way easier than you think. That boat sailing past Clint, Clint would be dead if they didn't notice and stop and pull him out of the water. Okay, this goes back to uh, the incident with Pierce Arrow. Uh, two boats that, I don't know, how, how close were they? It must have been pretty close if you're cl crossing tax. And they sailed away. Um, in my experience, when you go and help someone, the uh, jury will give you probably more time than you deserve. They will give you time because they want to encourage people to go back and pick up other boats. So just keep a record of your time. Go and help somebody. You'll get redressed. Don't worry about it. Uh, this was a big one. Um, take your sails down early. Be ready. Um, if it's more than you can handle, drop out. Like I say, we, if we had those conditions uh, next Friday, we, we won't even go to the start line. We'll come back to the club and watch the tracker. So, and uh, staying tethered to the boat, there's some debate about that, but that came out of the guys that were in the flooded boat. Um, they felt like it was better to stay near the boat, and then the, then the hovercraft had something to go and find. Ah, th so... Uh, incisor did not have their hatch port in. Okay, they just had a big open hole right in the middle of the boat. The reason was somebody was down below getting something out of a bag and they didn't want to feel all cooped up inside the boat. Uh, if it gets windy, put the hatch boards in. By the rules, you have to have a hatch board that's tethered to the boat. I hope everybody's got their hatch boards tethered to the boat because otherwise you're illegal. Okay, use them. If in doubt, use them. I think that was all the lessons that we had, yeah. It's a great lesson. Actually, I was talking to Barry Ford, who was on Dave Chard's boat, and they didn't have a second debrief. Um, they carried the sail area on. They, what they admitted afterwards, they didn't take the sail down anywhere near fast enough, so they got into trouble. And as you say, they didn't have a, a clean fuel tank, so uh, they hadn't changed the filters or anything. So they... Um, they uh, they did almost everything uh, everything wrong in that one. Oh, there's one more. Or we'll have bolt bolt cutters and our mini grinder with this to cut rigging. I mean that's a really important one. Um, and actually Barry talks about that story. Is they actually were they actually got handed a pair of of rigging cutters the start of the on, on the dock as they walked down. To, somebody said, hey, if you want a, you want a pair of wire cutters, they said sure. Good thing they had it. He said basically if they could never have cut the rig clear with the hacksaws they had. So. 
um, th with the with the with the, the big bolt cutters, they were able to do that. So have something serious that can take, not just a hacksaw, please. Yeah, hacksaws are. Yeah, go ahead. The, I remember it well. The race committee was furious at this guy for not telling them that he dropped out. They were so mad, and what was going on? And they were going to protest him. Well, he hadn't dropped out. He just hidden from the weather behind Bolinas, and he was still racing. He's the only guy, one of the only guys to finish the long course. Yeah, it's tough to do that without putting an engine on, though, I will say. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I think if I'm suspending racing, I'm dropping out personally. Because if you're, if you're at the point where you can't keep racing, you know, I don't think your crew is going to be ready to go sailing in a few hours. But that's just me. Great. Thanks, Rich. So... Final slide, it's my uh, top 10 tips here. I've already talked about this earlier. I mean, I take the starts really seriously on this race. I don't socialize. Uh, it's not uh, saying hello to all the guys from Seattle who I've missed and haven't seen them in a year. Do that in the Yacht Club the night before. Um, and when you get out there, really start to work on, on your start. Um, and even three quarters an hour, an hour in advance, get out there and start running that start line and get a feel for the current in particular. That's the thing that you really want to get. Um, being rested is really important. I know you all want to stay here and drink beer late on Thursday night. Try to avoid it if you can. Um, get to bed early. Get a good sleep. Um, you know, this, this is one that, you know, people I think often forget is, geez, I, I, I keep making mistakes, and we all make mistakes. You don't have to not make mistakes. You're, we are all going to make them. The key is make fewer mistakes than your competitors. Um, and if you do make a mistake, don't get down about it. Um, you can always get back. This is a race where you can always get back at it, um, if you, as you'll see further on here. Um, from my perspective, these races are usually won at night. Um, it, lots of stuff happens at night, and the, the better boats do better at night. Um, they're paying attention. Um, so, you know, I always try to preach, raise that in intensity level after dark. You can be a little sleepy in the afternoon if you want to. Um, it's, you're still rested. You can put someone to bed if they want to, go have a nap, whatever, but not, not at night time. It's a full court press. Get on deck and really, really push hard. Um, eat healthy and drink lots of water. Don't drink lots of cow coffee. If you've ever raced in any boats where people have drank a lot of coffee, um, good luck at 4 o'clock the next morning. Um, they're, they're usually uh, out of gas and they got nothing. So drinking water and staying hydrated, which is hard to do. Um, so in our boat, we always have water bottles in the cockpit, and we're always looking after each other, making sure we're all, all drinking water. Being attentive, uh, monitor boats around you. Uh, there's a lot of things to look at out there, even in the dark. Um, clouds, sea state, smoke on the shore. Um, you know, uh, 7 by 50 binoculars are your best friend. Hand-bearing compasses. Um, get a, well, what do you call them, those pencils you can write on the bulkhead that you can wipe off um, and start really tracking your competitors at night, take bearings on them, learn uh, where, their de where their nav lights are, are they intense, are they light, are they the masthead, are they tri-lights, are they deck mounted, um, so that everybody has some boats to track. You know, if you really want to keep people awake, assign boats to different people on the crew and let them tell them to track those boats for you. So when you ask, uh, um, you know, Where's Kinetic? I know where I can find them, assuming that you can actually see them. Um, um, obviously, you know, sail within your crew's ability. I mean, I think that's th that was a 2010 lesson a little bit as well, is that people, I think, didn't realize what they were getting themselves into. And I think falsely believe that they can handle those conditions when they really couldn't. Um, and I mean, I'm like you, even with all the experience we have in our boat, if it's blown like that on, uh, on next Friday morning, I ain't going. It's as simple as that. And, and I will definitely quit earlier than, than some other boats will. Um, stay relentless to the finish. It's a little bit like uh, the full court press. This is a race which get, can often be won in the last five miles or ten miles, you know, even on a long course. You can race 120, 130 miles, think you're doing great. That happened to us in 2014. 
sailed a flawless race, got off the south shore of Bow and sat, sat there for an hour and everyone passed us. Um, so stay relentless. Um, you can always climb back into this race. Most importantly, sail people you like and have fun. Um, that's the most important thing here. It doesn't matter how good your sailors are. Um, yeah, pick some good friends. If you've already picked your crew and they're not your friends, it's too late. Yeah, yeah. The crew lists have already gone in, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and lastly, um, I've got uh, Bruce Hendrick is going to be doing a, uh, a weather briefing for me that I'll present at the uh, skipper's meeting next week. Um, but uh, you'll, it'll also be posted on sailors.com if you're not familiar with that website. Um, keep, keep an eye open for that next Thursday. He'll probably publish it late in the Friday and Thursday afternoon. He does a great job of putting a real racer's forecast together. And, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, that'll be helpful to you. A lot better than the two slides I gave you. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, I can't really speak, sorry, oh, so the question was why uh, did the organizing authority uh, change one of the coastal requirements, which is for, for quite a deep reef, a second, I think it's a second set, I don't remember all the details. Um, I can't really speak for the organizing authority for this race, but I can speak, um, to an experience we had putting together similar uh, safety regulations for VARC a few years ago. And it basically the feeling is um, it's not required that often. Um, most boats here do not have it. If you, look around, if you look at what the regulation says, how deep that reef has to be, I think it's 40% or something. Um, I don't think there's more than two or three boats in Vancouver that would have a reef that deep. So you essentially you're saying to the whole fleet either uh, ignore the safety regulation or you can't sail. Um, so that's why in VARC anyway the, the decision was made to do it. Um, you know, really I don't think it's been a safety issue um, not having reefing that deep. But again, you've got to know your boat. If your boat isn't going to be able to reef properly, maybe you shouldn't be sailing in 50 knots of wind. Well, I'll just add to that too. I mean, I think if you if you've never been in that much wind, I mean, for a lot of us, we have sailed that much wind, and we've and we've tried it. We've tried other deep reefs, or we've tried it without a main. Um, a lot of the a lot of our boats, you can take a main down and sail with a jib, and it sails just great. I'm not saying all boats can do that. Um, ours can, um, and uh, probably a f I think a FAR 30 probably can sail that way too. So at least you can secure the mast, get the main down, and you actually can. And a lot of the lightweight boats, you can sail with a jib alone, but you got to try it. You got to practice it. Um, and at some point, um, so, but the, the important thing is, you know, you're responsible for the boat. If you're not comfortable with the conditions of the start or as the race progresses, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to keep going. So any other questions? Great. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Um, just a quick little wrap here. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, Peter and Rich. As usual, it's always a great, uh, a great presentation. Uh, for those uh, who can't make it, maybe want to pass that around to your friends. We will actually have the videos up on our uh, website. A um, couple days, probably by the weekend. Okay, we've already got the um, the, the the presentation we did on the 13th at uh, Vancouver Rowing Club up on the uh, website. So uh, I think it's under uh, useful links, I think is where it was. We had a bit of a problem uh, earlier this week giving uh, public access to it, but we've actually fixed that as of yesterday. So look for the, uh, the videos being posted there. Okay. And uh, great. Hey, everybody have a great race, and uh, we'll see you guys uh, a week tonight, hopefully. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>